Hi. Uh, really excited to be here, although when, um, when Andy invited me to come talk at XOXO Fest, I was really intimidated because although I've, over, over my long and storied and incredibly successful career, of course, I've given many public performances and lectured in the, the most august institutions in America and Europe. Um, but I've always spoken about whatever my particular project at the moment was, whether it was left-wing political cartoons and America's foreign policy or, or the history of pencil sharpening techniques and the best practices uh, therein, or, um, uh, you know, it was, always, it was always specific to whatever project I was promoting, a book tour or something like that. And he said that this, he just wanted me to come and talk about being creative and being an independent um, creative person. And I uh, said, well, I don't think I'm qualified right now because I'm not really working right now. My TV show is canceled and uh, uh, kind of waiting for my house to sell that I, so I have enough money to buy groceries. And, uh, and he said, no, that's great. That's like totally what we're all about. <laughs> the, like, the frustration, the failure, the struggle, the flop sweat, the night terrors. And I said, all right, I might be able to make this work. Um, <laughs> So, well, I'm going to do something that I've never done before and I've, and I've rarely seen done, and I'm doing it in a spirit of openness and, uh, and transparency in, in the hopes that it will help some few lost souls out here in this room. Everyone else is going to find this maybe the most boring presentation they have ever seen. So, sucks to be you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Thank you. So today is obviously the 15th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks. I was living in New York City at the time. And um, obviously, that's a very profound and somber anniversary because it set in motion a bunch of domestic and foreign policies that we will be dealing with for the rest of our lives and our children's lives. Slightly less importantly, it kind of marks the beginning of my career as a freelancer as a self-employed creative person. Because shortly after the 9-11 attacks, I started that uh, webcomic that Andy mentioned, uh, Get Your War On. And so today I was like, or this weekend, you know, thinking about what I was gonna talk about, I was in a very reflective mood and I was thinking about my career because once again, I'm in a time of transition, uh, which is a nice way of saying spending a lot of time in your pajamas, uh, wondering where your next check is gonna come from. So I thought, I was reviewing just the, the past 15 years of my career and, and realizing that as I've jumped from project to project and sensibility to sensibility and audience to audience, although let's face it, my core demographic seems to be nerdy white men 15 years younger than me uh, that assume I'm more interesting than I actually am. Um, the one constant has always been a steady hum of financial anxiety. What am I doing? How am I going to save for retirement? Where is my next check coming from? Where are my outstanding invoices? All that kind of stuff. And so whenever I've been at a conference like this and you see someone on stage talking about following your passion and doing what you really want to do and don't quit your day job or do quit your day job or what if your hobby is your day job or what if your day job is your hobby and it's just this huge swirl, I'm always sitting in the back of the auditorium like, I wonder how much money this motherfucker really makes. <laughs> so. So to you in the back, this is for you. Uh, this is not gonna be exciting. This is literally just 15 years <laughs> of how much money I made. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, so this is what it looks like. This is the steady, stable, not at all terrifying income stream for 15 years of being on your own, out in the world, trying to make stuff that somebody somewhere will pay you for. And I do want to mention a couple things. There's this phrase, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's really hot online, it's called acknowledging your privilege. Now, obviously, I have buckets of privilege. And I do want to say the only way I was able to uh, financially survive some of these dips were due to, I think, three really important factors. First of all, I have no dependence. I'm only financially responsible for myself. Second of all, I was lucky enough to graduate from college without any student debt. So my debt load has always been more or less manageable. Third of all, my parents, unlike their hippie son, 
were both employed for years by a state institution, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which meant they had a state employee pension and they saved and they were very frugal and they have enough liquidity that if I'm in between checks or in between gigs, they're able to loan me money to help me pay the mortgage until I get my next check from the production company or whatever. And I totally understand most people aren't that lucky. I just want to put that out there. I'm not here to comment on it really, although I just want to acknowledge like most, most regular people could not survive these types of ups and downs, and I'm lucky enough that I am able to. Okay, so that's the shape of it. Now I'm gonna show you the y-axis. This is the actual money, and this is so perfect because when we were loading this in PowerPoint, the $100,000 mark cut off, and that's awesome because I've always just wanted to have one year where I made $100,000. It's always just been like this quest. I just need to make six figures. Just once I'll die a happy man in my giant golden mausoleum that everyone gets once they earn $100,000. But even PowerPoint, like even on a theoretical, data-driven level, denies me that figure. It's like truly profound, right? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna go over really briefly uh, from 2002 to 2015. Now, obviously, there's, <laughs> oh my God, all right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> 2001, I was a fact checker at Maxim Magazine, uh, North America's leading peer-reviewed journal of European ontological studies. I don't remember how much money I made. I do remember I was unhappy. I had, been self, I had been stealing photocopies and, and photocopying and distributing on my own hand-stapled uh, editions of a comic that I had made called My New Fighting Technique is Unstoppable, which is basically, <laughs> thank you, thank you, karate fighters just yelling and cussing at each other. I was listening to a lot of, um, like, uh, this is late 90s uh, freestyle hip-hop battles that you could download uh, through your dial-up and uh, listen to, anyway. Uh, martial arts and language and, and men masking their insecurities by boasting about how tough they were, okay? Uh, fortunately, there's that, that trend is gone. Uh, <laughs> so I was a freelancer making a freelancer's income, which at the time in the magazine industry was $20 an hour. I just moved to New York. I was getting along fine, and I had this bonus fund money. I started to make money selling these comics that I had made at a previous really boring temp job given to my friends, and then my friends were like, this is funny, you should sell it. Anyway, okay, 2001, and then at the end of the year, obviously, 15 years ago today, there were the attacks, and then a month later, the America started bombing Afghanistan, Operation Enduring Freedom, and that night is when I started uh, this, which the old school people will remember, this was the comic, uh, and uh, <laughs> believe me, I was going through it, it hasn't aged well. <laughs> um, Obviously very didactic, bordering on humors, humorless, um, and uh, I'm, it was, this was pre-social media. There was no social media. There wasn't even MySpace. People would copy the URL, email it to their friends, and then type me out a good old-fashioned death threat. Um, <laughs> I would not, I, yeah. Now that there's Twitter, I'll, I will never stick my neck out about anything of importance ever again, okay? This turtle is fundamentally a coward, okay? All right. So I sent this comic to some friends and they sent it to their friends and it went around the internet like that and, and, uh, I, and you know, it was like one of those early uh, webcomic uh, viral things. Okay, but I didn't really make much money from it. So 2002, I was fact checking at Martha Stewart Weddings Magazine. Don't remember how much money I made. It was just as depressing as Maxim. Both of those magazines are basically pornography for different uh, <laughs> set, sets of readers, right? Okay, but you can see, look what happened here. The comic had become successful enough that I decided to start selling hats, t-shirts, mugs. Like I was like, I'm gonna ride this train. $11,000 of t-shirts I was just stuffing in bags in my tiny New York City apartment, still selling fighting technique. People were giving me donations via PayPal. Um, and then I was also starting to pick up a few cartooning clients. Now, this is the, we don't have time to get into this, but the one, a couple things you should keep in mind when reviewing these numbers is this is, all, this is pre tax, this is pre agents' fees, managers' fees, and uh, it's pre expenses. Like the merch, you know, it costs a lot of money. Like I made $11,000, I probably spent $8,000 standing in line at the post office mailing all this stuff. 
So I do want to I do want to mention that. But the other thing the other thing that gets complicated is I'm also not including the fact that for the book royalties for the Get Your War on Books, which were to come out, uh, we that was like a fundraising project. It was money that we donated to landmine relief in Afghanistan. So and I think that was because. I felt guilty about keeping money from something I had made for myself out of like a place of like deep personal anguish, and it was really dark and really profane. It was kind of like a uh, kind of kind of a fucked up comic. Um, so it became a fundraiser, and I've always struggled with the regret of giving away all that money when I should have saved it because it's better to. I, I could have used $100,000, but anyway. Um, so I guess, uh, you know what, I promised I wasn't going to give a lesson, but I should say, and this is something I'm sure you've heard a lot, and a lot of you probably are better at living with it than other people, but what you do is worth money, literally, because people are giving you money. And it is OK, and I'm just talking, I should turn my back and just say it to myself, <laughs> David, it is OK to keep the money people give you because they like what you make. All right. so. <laughs> All right, moving on. 2000, 2003. Look how much goddamn money I meant selling mugs and hats. Do people still do that? I don't even know. Do people still sell stuff like that on the internet? Really? Makes me so happy. Online donations, speaking fees. Uh, and then I got a book advance to do a proper published version of Fighting and Filing. And now the bottom one is the most important Rolling Stone the coolest magazine about rock and roll in all of history. <laughs> Rolling Stone thought I was the new hot thing, and they decided to start publishing my cartoon in every issue. And this relationship was long and somewhat lucrative and went on for years and years. And Rolling Stone allowed me to stop fact checking for the enlightened feminists at Maxim Magazine <laughs> and the noble spiritual ascetics at Martha Stewart Weddings Magazine. <laughs> and I became self-employed for the first time. And if 11-year-old David had known that in his, I guess I was 31 at the time, he was going to be making a living as a professional cartoonist, he, ne he never would have stopped jumping up and down and clapping his hands uh, for joy. So this was, this was big for me. This was 2003 was when I made that transition from having cartooning being a hobby to having it becoming a job. And as we will see, that led to catastrophic spiritual, emotional, and financial crises in my life. So follow your dreams, but right up to the point where they become your job and then run the fuck in the other direction. OK. <laughs> 2004. I, 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 was going, I was in my hotel room last night when I should have been playing tabletop games or, or watching Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared, going through these Excel spreadsheets like, 29,000, who bought all these coffee cups? <laughs> Uh, speaking fees, uh, yeah, anyone who can get paid to, to give a talk about something, do it. It's, it's free money. Okay. <laughs> 2004. 2005, The Guardian, a very prestigious British newspaper. I grew up an Episcopalian, so for my parents, this was the height of accomplishment. <laughs> Our son's cartoons are going to be published in the paper of record for <laughs> British leftists. <laughs> We want to assassinate the queen. We couldn't be right, finally. OK. Anyway, uh, bah, 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 bah. oh, I picked up a little money designing a book for the journalist Matt Taibbi. We had got, come to know each other through both being at Rolling Stone. And Matt is an investigative reporter, obviously, and has been writing really incisively about the financial crisis. And uh, we designed a book for one of his books. And we made the cover so very deliberately ugly. It was so ugly that when we submitted, the publisher submitted the cover to Amazon, Amazon rejected it because they thought somebody had hacked. <laughs> into the publisher's database and submitted a book cover to make Matt look bad. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll, I'll, you know what, I'll, let me, I've been told to pepper my talk with amusing anecdotes, so I'll tell you one funny thing. <laughs> one funny thing I remember about uh, Matt Taibbi is I, we were, I was in DC and he was in DC, we met for lunch and uh, I was like, yeah, I, I was, um, uh, let's see, at this point, I was anxious enough that it was starting to affect my relationship. And I was talking to Matt, like moaning and groaning, yeah, I don't know, like things are kind of rocky, I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, I feel kind of, you know, uh, uh, well, anyway, what are you working on? And Matt was like, you know, I think, um, I think I'm kind of trying to bring down Goldman Sachs. <laughs> and sure enough, six months later, he wrote the Vampire Squid article. Anyway, whatever. Okay. <laughs> hey, that was my amusing anecdote. I hope you like it, because I'm going to use it three more times. Okay. <laughs> 
2006, everything's humming along. Now, the reason that 2006 is important is look at this last line item, film option. Has anyone here ever had something optioned by a Hollywood person? There's one, okay, there's another. This is the greatest blessing and the greatest curse. A screenwriter came to me and wanted to option my new fighting technique is unstoppable, my karate clip art comic, which as far as I'm concerned is like one of the heights of human achievement and I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, <laughs> and he optioned it, which basically he gives you $5,000 for free so that he has the exclusive, he or she, in this case it was a he, has the exclusive right to make a movie out of it. And I thought this is it. I've spent three years now being a cartoonist and now I'm about to transition into Hollywood, right? Guaranteed money maker. I'm going to be so famous. I'm gonna be the new Daniel Klaus, that level of fame. <laughs> where Daniel Klaus can't walk down the street without teeny boppers running him over, right? <laughs> I heard that Jack Black was interested in starring in the movie version of My New Fighting Technique is Unstoppable. I thought I was gonna become best friends with Jack Black. Do you see Jack Black in this room? <laughs> okay, 2007, still making all this money. The guy renewed the film option for the last time. Uh, theater company in Austin, Texas made a theatrical version of Get Your War On, so that was a little money, that was fun. 2008, now this is important. Look at that Huffington, I started getting that Huffington Post money, okay? <laughs> Huffington Post had a short-lived, maybe because they were burning through piles of cash. <laughs> Humor site, it was called 23.6, it had big money. And once again, I picked up a second sugar daddy. Now keep in mind the context. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, the way that most left-wing cartoonists made their money was syndicating among the nation's thriving field of alt-weekly newspapers at $20 per comic. And if you got enough of those newspapers, you know, like the, I'm not gonna mention anyone's names, but you know the famous lefty political cartoonists, you can make a good living in $20 increments. I had a little of that on the side, but I really just had these, you know, these big, I mean, Rolling Stone and, and, and uh, Huffington Post paying money. And the Huffington Post was for animated versions of my cartoons. And that was great because by this point, I was deep enough into the freelancing career and the glamorous cartooning career. I was spending most of my waking hours alone reading documents about genocide and torture and uh, John Ashcroft, really kind of going into a little bit of a sinkhole. And so collaborating on these animations was a lot of fun. Um, so that was great because it was lucrative and I was reminded that I am a human among humans, as my friend Sam loves to say to me, quoting Dostoevsky, who was a famous and very wealthy Russian novelist. So, <laughs> what is work? This has been a central tension in my life as a cartoonist because I didn't even draw the fucking things. It was just clip art. I got, I got a lot of haters out there in the cartooning community, okay? I wasn't even a real cartoonist. All I did was use the same three pieces of clip art and then type in a new rant about Dick Cheney, hit send, Rolling Stone paid me a lot of money for it. I felt guilty about it. That's why I gave the money away. But when I think about it, I was working. This is a list of every periodical I was subscribing to when I was a political cartoonist. And I would spend all damn day reading these things. Everything from National Review to Z Magazine. You know, so because my parents had nine to five jobs at a university, it was very obvious when they were at work. They weren't at home. And when they got home, it was obvious. They weren't working. We were playing basketball or watching Masterpiece Theater. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> my career was much more sludgy and murky. Do you know what I mean? I can't tell if I'm working. I'm hitting refresh on talkingpointsmemo.com all afternoon. Is that work or am I avoiding working? It got, it's, it's very, very confusing. Obviously. You know, nowadays I feel like our culture is much more open to like, oh no, you're always working. That's the wonderful thing about smartphones and technology. You're always in the office. Isn't that great? You know, anyway, this, but this was, <laughs> this was something I was struggling with. Okay, 2009, I was done. I always promised myself I would quit cartooning when Bush left office. I was really, really unhappy, really depressed, literally crying with frustration about the situation I was in. Reading those papers every day and then having a deadline and having to make a joke about torture at Abu Ghraib or something. I understand that's a pretty sweet position to be in, but it was, it was killing me. I was completely creatively cut off. It no longer was cathartic or rewarding or interesting to me. Because let's remember, I wasn't even drawing. 
There's only so much you can do with five pieces of clip art. Believe me, I did it. <laughs> so that was, 2009 was the final comic, my final comic for Rolling Stone. And yes, that's how much Rolling Stone was paying me per comic, $1,400. I know, if I could turn back the hands of time, right? Okay, fortunately an NGO that wanted to <laughs> prevent Europe from developing gas pipelines in Turkmenistan had a shit ton of money and they paid me to make some cartoons about Turkmenbashi, who I think actually, just a little uh, side note here, Trump is a perfect analogy to Turkmenbashi. It's not Hitler or Stalin, it's Turkmenbashi, the idiot who had a golden statue built of himself that rotates so it's always facing the sun. Check it out, okay. <laughs> um, but you can see in an election year, 2008, Speaking fees, $6,000. Once I had quit, speaking fees, a cool $50. <laughs> Almost enough to make it to and from the venue. I know how the game is played. Okay, 2010. I was broke. My friend said, why don't you go get a job working at the census, knocking on doors? So I did. I put on the bag, I went around my neighborhood in, in the Hudson Valley in New York with my bag and knocked on doors and got yelled at by people who thought I'd come to take away their guns. Uh, and I made a little bit of money doing that. That was, I'm gonna say that was humbling. Because I had made the decision to quit my free, steady freelance career right on the precipice of a global recession. I had no backup plan. I just assumed something else will fall into my lap just like with my cartoons. I was just making stuff for myself, and people responded to it, and then I made all this money. That'll happen again, right? Isn't that just the way the world works for people like me? Cut to me like, you know, it's the United States Census, may I have a few moments of your time? No, <laughs> okay. Got so desperate that when a New York magazine wanted me to reboot Get Your War On for a one-time special, I had to swallow my pride and do it. Now, look at that bottom line. This is where the story actually gets inspiring. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The first day of census trading, we all have to sharpen pencils because the census forms are filled out in number two pencils. I'm sitting there sharpening the pencil, watching the shaving come out of the sharpener. Haven't done it in years because remember, I didn't draw the cartoons. <laughs> I haven't used a pencil in 20 years. I'm sitting there sharpening the pencil. I'm like, you know what, I'm actually pretty good at this. I have the sharpest pencil in this room. <laughs> I wonder if I could get paid to sharpen pencils. The rest, as they say, is uh, internet history for a small, small subsection of uh, a certain demographic. Now, before we go on, you're wondering why I only made $1,000 at the US Census. I had to stop working for the Census because I was getting divorced and I got shingles all over my face and I was too scary looking to go knock on doors. <laughs> so. In the interest of a dynamic presentation that is not just us going through and pretending that we're my accountant, like, oh, what happened there? <laughs> the next slide, fair warning, is a picture of me with shingles on my face. Uh, I'm going to put it up on the, on the uh, screen. If you don't want to look at it, close your eyes, uh, and you'll be able to tell what it looks like from the reactions of the audience. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is where I was at in 2010. Okay. <laughs> 20, 2011 was when um, the uh, pencils started taking off. So I had very deliberately styled artisanal pencil sharpening. This, this was a very deliberate and business oriented way, like I am going to do it, I challenged myself. What, how, what do I have to do to get paid to sharpen pencils? Can it be done? I mean, yes, all you need are two things. I, and I'm here in Portland, so I, you guys knew this before I did. All you need is a white guy in a black apron, because obviously he knows what he's doing. And then you need the word artisanal, because then obviously it's worth every penny. Now, this next slide, look at that. I really want to drop the microphone. Right. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm out of town. So then we made a TV show, it led to a TV show. This is us at the uh, Television Critics Association. I just want to point out the faces of my producers, Christine and Joe, as I demonstrate the proper uh, throwing technique for a paper airplane. Uh, they're obviously thrilled that they've decided to work with me. Again, 
This was like the moment when I got a film option. I thought, I have a TV show. And I do want to mention, acknowledge my privilege, the only reason I was ever on TV is because Christine Connor is a good friend of mine who is in television and saw me do the pencil stuff and said, maybe we could turn that into a, a show where you, it's a how-to show about the things you think you know how to do, how to tie your shoes, how to open a door, all that kind of stuff. Again, I thought, this is it. I'm, on the, I'm about to, the, my world is about to change. I'm about to be wealthy. I have enough, I know enough people on TV to know that anyone who is on TV is worth at least a million dollars. Guaranteed. Well, that didn't happen. Um, so for anyone who's interested, I just thought I would show this because I feel like sometimes people are scared to ask about what they're worth or they're not really sure and the only people they have to talk to are their agents and managers who have their own reasons for keeping things a little bit hazy. So this is what I made uh, from being the, I had a writer's fee and a hosting fee for going deep. So it was $40,000 that year and then when we went into the second, it was canceled, one network canceled it and the other network picked it up which is unusual, and then I thought, okay, well, this is it. I have a second wind. Now surely I'll be on the Millionaire's Club, right? No. Um, oh, and then my friend and I got hired to write a script for Archer. That was a little money, but I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that, so I won't put that out there. And then I got uh, paid for making, writing cartoons in the New York Times, and then we got fired because we had a fight with the New York Times, so that was wonderful. Uh, and then I made this. I made this mashup for fun. I got so into mashups, and this is important, and I'm not the only person who said this this weekend, it's always good to have a hobby where there's no way to monetize it. There is no way to turn ma my mashups into a career because, one, they're not very good. Second of all, uh, you get in trouble. These all got taken down by Taylor Swift's uh, record label. Going on, um, so you can see I was making money for I'm Going Deep because I was doing all the animations and doing the music. We also shot it in my living room. This was not an expensive TV show to make. Um, and that brings us, and then I drove across the country putting up flyers to promote the show because the network said, what's your social media strategy? And it was like, I think we'll just go around the country putting up flyers. That sounds like a cool uh, promotional strategy. Never thought to ask any money to, to drive around for two weeks. It's just not the way my mind works. Uh, but I did have a great time in here. I am with my sound guy, Ray, and Joshua Tree putting up flyers where everyone can see them. <laughs> and uh, the flyers had those little tags on it. You could call, call the number, and I would pick up and say, hi, do you have any questions? They'd be like, well, just David, what are you guys doing? Uh, so um, I think that's it. Uh, uh, I, and the only reason I put this up here is because this was just so fun. I had never driven across the country before. And I was in a situation where the network you know, let us drive across the country. I didn't make any money from it, but it's the one, it's come, we're coming up on the year since we did that, and like, this is one of my fondest memories, hanging out with these guys and doing this. So I guess I'm ending with kind of a murky thing about like, yeah, if you don't have any responsibility to anyone other than yourself and your parents are helpful, like, don't worry about making money, just go out and have fun. But I, on the other hand, I am fucking 44 years old. It is time to start thinking about retirement. Like, turns out I'm not going to live forever unless you all donate me vials of your youngest, freshest blood, then, <laughs> then maybe I have a chance. <laughs> Just have a huge bloodletting section outside the, outside the exit. Uh, and now, thanks to my friend Starley, I've entered the world of podcasting. So I do want to leave you with an influential final figure. This is how much money we've made already from our podcast. I smashed through that $100,000 ceiling. And then I smashed through the billion dollar ceiling. And if I can do it by following my dreams and ignoring my best financial interests, so can you. Thank you. Bye-bye.